Welcome to Quick Takes. My name is Dr. David Greitzer and I'm a staff psychiatrist here at CAMH. Uh, as you know, in July, the Ministry of Transportation uh, in Ontario changed reporting requirements. Joining us today to discuss, Dr. Brittany Pointer, who's medical head of our emergency services and associate chief, and Travis Barron, who's a, a resident and a medical doctor here at CAMH. Um, why don't we start by talking about a, a few cases and how we might approach these cases in our emergency departments or uh, on our inpatient wards or in our outpatient clinics. Does that sound fair? Sounds good. Sounds great. All right. So let's look at case one. Um, young man comes to our emergency department. Uh, he has fairly significant psychotic symptoms over the months leading up to that presentation, auditory hallucinations, very concerned about CSIS, very concerned about Donald Trump, uh, and there's no history of substance. What are some things that you guys might think about in terms of whether or not to report? Brittany? Well, I mean, based on the case I th and the new guidelines, I think this is very clear, uh, clearly reportable. He has acute psychosis, he has abnormalities of perception, he has an untreated illness, uh, and it's been going on for quite some time. To me, this is very clear, uh, a very clear case that would be reportable. And, and the reason for that is, unlike in the past requirements, now there's more of a focus on psychosis. There's a real focus on psychosis, and it, it in fact, I I polled some of our uh, colleagues who work in schizophrenia, and um, they agree that you know for some people's practices, the new requirements would include uh, reporting almost anybody in their practice. You know, for many people with schizophrenia, their illnesses are chronic; they have recurring symptoms. Even at best, uh, they ha they suffer with you know some symptoms of psychosis, and so one would always be mandated to report them. Because of that change in the, the language around transient versus non-transient. That's right. Travis, do you want to weigh in? Uh, yes, certainly, and I think uh, Dr. Pointer put, put her finger on it. Uh, this is, based on the uh, clinical scenario given, likely to reoccur, uh, meaning that it is not distinctly transient and is mandatory to be reported. Uh, if this was an acute onset of psychosis and there was the absence of substance use, uh, one could argue it, it would be a brief psychotic disorder. And depending on uh, the clinical picture, you could make the argument it is unlikely to reoccur uh, and would not need to report. But in this instance, I do believe uh, this is concerning for a primary psychotic illness such as schizophrenia based on the prodrome. Mm -hmm. So to pivot for a bit, if this were a patient who'd come to an emergency department with many years of illness, several past hospitalizations, any hesitation on your part to report? So I think the question there is less around psychosis and more around what constitutes acute. Uh, when we look at uh, the language in the legislation, um, insofar as what constitutes acute, we really need to rely on the CCMTA uh, driving documents, uh, which are actually built into the legislation. Uh, they describe anything uh, acute as a change in perception, anything other than baseline. Uh, if individuals uh, lack insight into their symptoms, all of those things uh, are signs that there may be an acute psychosis going on. So, so there you would think uh, perhaps a little bit more. Written. I think if somebody's illness is chronic and they have recurring hospitalizations, to me that indicates a level of instability uh, and possibly questionable compliance or adherence to treatment or, or treatment that just isn't working, that there's a refractory illness. And, and I, I would tend to report in those cases as well. The way the requirements are written, you would report whether or not your patient had endorsed actually having a driver's license. That's how it's written. So psychosis is handled differently. If we had this conversation a year ago, mm -hmm. you may have hesitated a little bit more before reporting. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, the legislation has always been clear uh, in, insofar as uh, whether or not someone owns a driver's license. Uh, you have always needed to report in those instances. Uh, that is not new with the new legislation. I think what was happening in the past is physicians were assessing the whole clinical picture. Uh, what is the likelihood of this individual getting in a car, causing an accident, that sort of thing. And now physicians are really being asked to look at purely the diagnosis, the presence or absence of a diagnosis, and not asked to assess uh, driving risk, for example. Okay, so a, a big change around psychosis. Let's talk about another case. A uh, person comes to our emergency department. We're coming into the holidays, and perhaps this story is too familiar with us. Uh, 
alcohol use problems over the years significantly worse. There's job-related stress, there's personal-related stress. Here's a person who, like many of our patients, has struggled uh, with his uh, substance use and has sought sobriety and at points has done very well and other points hasn't really followed up with AA and sister organizations and has just done badly. And he presents after a two-day binge. What are your thoughts about reportability, Brittany? To me, this case isn't as cut and dry as the last case. I think we have to decide what does engagement in treatment mean. And I think that's a pretty subjective term, especially when it comes to um, people with substance use disorders. So 50% engagement in follow-up appointments actually among the entire population might actually be pretty good. For me, that, that's a big question. What does engagement mean? And for some people, for some providers, it might even be a willingness to attend appointments, right? That might be considered a engagement. That might be enough. Um, I think in this scenario, you know, he has made strides. He's cut down on his drinking. He's very clear on his pattern of drinking. Um, and I would want to speak to the wife to get her uh, sense of whether there's been any, any risky behaviors. I wouldn't necessarily automatically report. Travis? Well, I agree with Dr. Pointer. There are some questions particularly around um, uh, engagement in treatment and what that constitutes. Uh, what is more clear in this scenario is that this does constitute a uncontrolled substance use disorder. Uh, according to the CCMTA documents, which are built into the legislation, for a substance use disorder to be considered controlled, you need to reach remission and or 12 months of abstinence, uh, which is clear uh, to not be the case um, uh, for this gentleman. Uh, that being said, if you do decide that this gentleman is relatively engaged in treatment, you still are in a position to make a discretionary report, and we must always be cognizant that the absence of a mandatory duty to report does not mean the absence of a duty to report. Uh, so for in that instance, if you ultimately do decide he is participating in treatment, I think speaking to the wife is very, very important so that you can get a sense for any high-risk driving behaviors, any reason or, uh, or thought that why you may need to issue a permissive or discretionary report in this instance. With substance then, to, to speak a little bit more succinctly, engagement is something different than we thought of before. Okay? But with a case like this, what we're also wondering about too is... Uh, the collateral and what more information we have. There, there's a little bit of a gray more, I think, in the wording than in the wording over psychosis. Brittany, I know you've spoken to some of our colleagues, and how have they weighed in? I think there's a real um, uh, difference in terms of opinions and what constitutes engagement. Right. In the emergency department, may be uh, far more likely to report. In fact, I think we always have been far more likely to report uh, than our colleagues who work with these individuals in our addiction programs. Uh, and for some of them, uh, as I said earlier, a willingness to attend appointments would constitute engagement and treatment. Thank so you. they may be reporting less frequently now than they were previously. So to take a step back, if we talk about the changes around psychosis, that seems a lot more clear. Again, there's that gray zone and, and one can, can wonder about certain cases. When we talk about substance here, it seems a lot more gray and a lot more open to interpretation. And again, the catchphrase is engagement. Is That's that right. fair? Yeah. Both of you agree? Yeah. Fair enough. Um, let's talk about one last case. I mean, we've talked about somebody with substance and we've talked about engageability in care. What happens if we take a 27-year-old woman who shows up to the emergency department uh, with opioid use disorder uh, and has never been diagnosed before, though she recognizes she's had this problem for a while and has never engaged in care, but boy, she's interested in care and detox. The, these cases, although they, they illustrate sort of the, the challenges, um, in the emergency department I would gather so many more details. I would gather so much more information to, to base my decision on. It's really hard for me to comment in this scenario what I would do. I mean, I would be wanting to know about her driving history, whether she has a car, whether she has a license. I know that's not part of the legislation, but I would still want to know those things. Sure. I would want to know, um, you know, has she made attempts to engage in any treatment in the past? Um, how much is she using? How often is she using? Has she had any unintentional overdoses? I would want to speak to somebody from her family or friends, somebody who could corroborate her, her story and the information she's providing. So 
I would only make the decision whether to report or not once I had all of that other information at hand. It's complicated. It's complicated, and and I think that we, in these sort of scenarios, these have you know huge implications to revoke somebody's license, and so we're obligated to do a deep dive into somebody's history and and determine you know this may be a life changing decision that we're making, and so we owe it to them to get as much information as possible. Well said, Travis. You know, when it comes to first presentation of a substance use disorder, I think this is one of the instances where the new legislation actually gives physicians tools to help individuals with their long-term recovery. So when it comes to the law, there are clear obligations with mandatory reporting, and it doesn't ask you to consider one's driving history. That being said, if this is a first-time presentation of a substance use disorder, there is not yet treatment to adhere to, which means you are not in a position to make a mandatory report to begin with. Again, I'll, uh, I, I'll highlight here that the absence of an obligation to make a mandatory report does not constitute the absence of an obligation to report. You must assess whether or not you should issue a permissive or discretionary report at this time. And in those instances, I think there is a huge benefit to what Dr. Pointer was saying in terms of diving into someone's history, determining any high-risk driving behaviors. Are they truly interested in treatment? Is this actually the first time that they've accessed uh, services and looking for help for this? What I myself have been doing, as well as a number of my colleagues in the emergency department, I really use this as, a, as an opportunity to tell individuals uh, that treatment uh, for their substance use disorder is essential. And if they don't follow up with treatment recommendations which are made in the emergency department, in the future when they access the healthcare system, they are going to be reported to the Ministry of Transportation on a mandatory basis. I think that's always a good idea. Right. Read somebody the Riot Act and tell them the risks if they continue with their current behavior. Right, and to think about risks not just in terms of the substance, but in terms of impact on life, like driver's licensure. Of course. Let's shift gears for a moment and do a rapid fire minute where we'll, we'll talk uh, about some of these things um, uh, in perhaps uh, a serious but not overly serious matter. Can we have one minute on the clock? Um, Brittany, is this a big deal? Yes. Has this changed? Your practice? Yes. How? I'm reporting more people. Yeah. How many more people do you think? Mm, good question. Mm, I don't know, 25% more, 50% more. Wow. And, and, what and I'm seeing more people being reported. Right. And, and it, it's around psychosis? It's around addiction? That's right. It's around those two. Yeah. And those are the issues that, that, that cause you the most stress in terms of interpreting the, the, the changes. For sure. What, uh, what are you worried about? I'm worried about inconsistency uh, in our department between emergency departments and among services at CAMH in, in how we as healthcare providers interpret the legislation. What advice would you give to our colleagues? We need to come together as a team. We have to really go through the new legislation with a fine-toothed comb, as Travis has done, um, and develop, I think, some further guidelines and, to help us. And at the buzzer, one quick question. Is the Ministry of Transportation Deputy Minister off your Christmas card mailing list? This year. Okay, Travis. She did pretty well. Okay. Are you, are you stoked? Yes. One minute. Uh, Travis, are you reporting more? Uh, I made three Ministry of Transportation reports in all of PGY-1. I've made 45 reports in PGY-2. Are you over-reporting, Travis? Uh, I don't think I am over-reporting. I do think I am following the legislation to the most literal interpretation of the uh, uh, text. And, and that's fair, and you've obviously done a deep dive, but some of our colleagues agree to disagree. W what are the cases where you think that they disagree with you the most? I think when it comes to uh, acute psychosis in particular, uh, there's often been uh, a bit of a back and forth um, uh, in terms of whether or not to report someone as it relates to their likelihood of driving in the future. Is this legislation, pardon me, is this requirement change fair? Uh, I don't think it is, actually. I think uh, the Ministry of Transportation in the old system uh, did very little on their part to actually assess individuals when it comes to their ability to drive. Uh, and with the new legislation, they assess individuals even less. And they're asking physicians to make a determination on ability to drive based on the presence or absence of a diagnosis. And at the buzzer, Travis, do you think this will contribute to stigma? Without a doubt. Thank you, guys. And that's Quick, Quick Takes podcast on Ministry of Transportation requirements. Quick Takes with CAMH Education is a production of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. You can find links to the relevant content mentioned in the show, a video version of the episode, 
and accessible transcripts of all the episodes we produce online at porticonetwork.ca slash podcasts. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe. Until next time. <laughs>